Hello again. Right, so we've been talking about the bones of the upper limb. We looked at the humerus and we looked at the radius. So what's left? What's left is the ulna. And we've, we've mentioned the ulna a few times because you kind of have to talk about the other bones when you talk about one of the bones. But the aim is to talk about the bone itself, but to talk about the little lumpy bony bits, which um, maybe you kind of skip over, maybe you haven't looked at in too much detail. So we're just going to go, go through them, proximally to distally, boom, 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 boom. Talk about what attaches there, but, you know, just so you've heard of them as much as anything else. So we're, we're on the left side of this skeleton. These bones are that way up. <laughs> These bones are left-sided as well. So let's talk about the ulna. By the way, ulna is spelt is spelt U-L-N-A, right? That's the bone, U-L-N-A, not with an R on the end. Anything kind of related to the bone gets spelt U-L-N-A-R. It's like a possessive version of the word. So the, the ulnar nerve has got an R on the end of it. But the bone, the bone is U-L-N-A. And look, it's a fairly distinctive bone, isn't it? Look at that. Kind of stands out, looks different to all the other bones. So let's have a look at the bony features of the ulna. Okay, so look, this is uh, the really prominent feature up here, isn't it? We've got this big curve in here, and then it's kind of a skinny bone distally. It is, because of this sticky outy bit here, at this end, it is a little bit longer than the radius. It articulates, it articulates at the elbow joint, but it actually doesn't quite get as far as the carpal bones. It doesn't actually quite get as far as the wrist, so it doesn't articulate with the carpal bones directly. That's kind of the radius's job. That's weird, isn't it? I don't know if you noticed that before, the ulna not really getting involved. Um, but that distinctive shape up here, that's what accounts for that hinge joint at the elbow. All right, so let's have a look, see what makes that up. Get out of it. This is the left arm, right? So this is my left arm, this is the skeleton's left arm, look, thumbs over here, thumbs over here. Um, the ulna then is, is medial, right? So the, the radius is lateral, the ulna is medial. Always remember that because here you're banging your ulna nerve and that's a very medial sensation going to your little finger, right? So ulna is always medial. The, the ulna, ulna stuff is on the medial side of the forearm. Um, and the most noticeable feature I think is is this sticky outy bit back here which is very sticky outy on this one. This is the olecranon. Now as far as I'm concerned the olecranon is important because when I fall off my bike I tend to bounce off my olecranons as I roll around. <laughs> when I, I crash and I roll so my olecranons are covered in little scars. Olecranons all over, look at this, all over here. Little scars all over the place from uh, falling off bikes and cracking my electron on many, many, many times. And they're very pointy. Uh, some people are pointier than others. Now the true purpose, well, let's say there are a couple really, aren't there? One purpose of the electron on is that the triceps muscle is posterior to the humerus, right? It's an insertion point for the triceps brachii muscle, which means that a sticky outy electron on is something the muscle's tendon can insert into and also gives like a little bit of a, an advantage of leverage at the elbow joint. You know, so the, so the uh, <coughs> triceps inserts here and what triceps does is it extends uh, the elbow joint. So it extends the forearm at the elbow joint, right? Bump. Um, so that's the electron on there. That's the ulna bone. And the other thing it does is, is if we need to form this curve to articulate with the humerus, the electron on is forming part of that curve, isn't it? So that's another, if we didn't have the electron on, you'd be cutting off most of that curve. So you wouldn't have such a pronounced hinge joint. Um, on the other side of the electron on, we have this. And this sticky outy bit is the coronoid process. And you see, look, the coronoid process is forming the other part of this curve. And the curve here is called the trochlear notch because we saw the humerus. The humerus has the trochlea here and the trochlear notch then curves.
curves around it. So there's the trochlea and there's the trochlea notch. So that's forming the serious part of the hinge joint of the elbow. Olecranon, coronoid, oh yeah, so the coronoid process, do you remember we also saw that if the coronoid process is forming part of the trochlear notch, when you, when you flex your elbow joint, you don't want to be restricted by that bony bit. So that, that bony bit of the coronoid process disappears into a, into a recessed bit of bone in the humerus. Um, which is this bit here. So there's the coronoid process. Here's the coronoid fossa on the humerus. And as we flex the elbow, the coronoid process disappears into the coronoid fossa. Go back, have a look at the humerus video if you want to see that again. Okay, now, <clears throat> as, we, as we move distally, so this is the proximal end, there's also a, a radial notch here, you see? Mm. So this is the radial notch. It's got a little bit of uh, black on here. This was a bit of Velcro that's worn out. So the radial notch, guess what attaches here? The radius, although it doesn't actually attach there. Now, when we looked at, if we put these two together, the head of the radius is round. And the reason the head of the radius is round is so that it can rotate, right? which is what gives us pronation and supination, pronation and supination. That's the, that's the, <laughs> whoop, that's the radius rotating, right, about the ulna. So if we turn it around, you can see that what's happening there is, yeah, the head of the radius, which is round, nestles into the radial notch. <clears throat> so those two bones, and it's held together with a, you've got a ligament around there holding it all together. So then the radius rotates, recessed rather beautifully into that radial notch. All right, so this notch here, radial notch. I know we're not talking about soft tissue too much, but the ligament that goes over the top is the annular ligament. Anyway, right now, what have we got? Now, can you see, can you see there's a tuberosity down here, right? So we talk about tuberosities on bones, lumpy bits. Lumpy bits usually mean something attaches there um, if it's not making a shape like this. Now, the radius has a radial tuberosity. The ulna has an ulna tuberosity. And can you see there's a thickening here, a tuberosity there. And what's this guy got? There's a little bit of a one here. You know, these plastic bones, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not so good. And that's an insertion site for the muscle brachialis, which is coming down from here to insert into the ulna there, right? Brachialis is one of those flexor muscles across the elbow joint. Now, so this is, this is the, the proximal end. And we move into the shaft of the, the ulna. Now the shaft of the ulna, like the shaft of the radius, isn't nice and round. It's rounded, and you can see this side is rounded, but it comes to an edge here. Can you see there's an edge there? All right, there's the edge. And the reason there's an edge here, which kind of gives it a triangular profile, is because when you put these two bones together, they are not only attached at either end and held together by ligaments, but there's a membrane in between the two bones, which of course is the interosseous membrane, interosseous between the bones. So there's an interosseous membrane in between the two, and that interosseous membrane is coming from that edge, and another edge on the radius, which is why we've got this flat part. So that's why, it, that's why it has that sort of shape. But you can see the ulna is a fairly slender bone along its length. It's not taking the same sort of forces along it that the radius is. It's, it's, it's kind of doing some different jobs here. Um, but before we get to that, the shaft, um, now if this, is, if this is the left side, this is medial and this is lateral, just down here on that, uh, just down here on the lateral side, we start to see this ridge starting to form. Can you see that? If this is the tuberosity of the ulna here, and this is that ridge. Can you see there's a ridge starting to form here? This is on the lateral side. This is the supinator crest. And just here, between the two, 
there's a little fossa. So this is the supinator fossa. Now what this is, this is an attachment site for the supinator muscle. And I'm good if you still have the Velcro, right? Um, you see what we've done? So um, this is the anterior side. Turn it around, this is kind of the posterior side. So that supinator crest is in there. And the supinator muscle then will come from that and wrap around the radius to insert into the shaft of the radius. And of course, what, what supinator does is, uh, if that's pronation, supination will revert to that, right? So, so if, if this is pronation, then supinator is going to wrap around and it's going to pull the radius back, right? Kind of something like that. Okay, and that's most of it. So most of the interesting bony bits are up at uh, up at the elbow end, at the proximal end, because they're forming the joint and they've got stuff attached to them and that. And as we go down the shaft of the ulna, we get to the end, and we can see the end doesn't look terribly interesting. And this is actually the head of the ulna. So the head of the ulna is at the distal end. So the head is is down here. Whereas, of course, when we were looking at the radius, the head of the radius is up at the elbow end, up here. So that's nice and confusing. I would apologise, but it's not my fault. I just try and teach this stuff. Head of the radius is at the elbow, whereas the head of the ulna is distally down by the wrist. It's the, you know, it's the, it's the skinny bit, right? That's the head, is the skinny bit. So down here then, distally, the head of the ulna is articulating with the radius but it's not quite articulating with the carpus, with the bones of the wrist, the carpal bones, right? Um, and this is probably why it's so skinny and so small. There's actually a gap there. And in life, there's a triangular articular disc filling the space between the head of the ulna and the carpal bones. So the disc and a whole bunch of ligaments here all contribute and come together to form the triangular fibrocartilaginous complex which is tying all this down, all right? So that's the head of the ulna. And look, can you see this pointy thing here, right? So look, here's the ulna. Uh, and this is on the posterior surface. Look, there's a sticky uppy bit. What do you think that sticky uppy bit is? That is the styloid process of the ulna. And then we saw a styloid process of the radius, didn't we, when we were looking at the radius? Yeah, so if these stick these two together, look, that's the styloid process of the radius. Go and have a look at that video if you want to see that in more detail. And this is a styloid process of the ulna, another sticky uppy bit. Um, so for the attachment of ligaments and what have you. Now, what I didn't mention in the radius video is that you can actually palpate these styloid processes. That's what you can feel at the wrist. If you go up here, you can feel the carpal bones, right? But if you go like at the base of the anatomical snuff box, like really, really distal, you can feel these lumps at the end of the radius and the end of the, the ulna. And that there, that is the styloid process of the ulna. And that there, that is the styloid process of the radius. Now it's useful to be able to palpate those two things, so find them on your own wrist. Because if you suspect a fracture, well, if there's pain on palpation, then that could be fractured. Also, but nowhere the, where you would normally expect to palpate these things. If they've moved, then maybe there's a fracture further up that you're considering, and the bone has, and the bone has moved, right? It's changed shape, and it's pulled those styloid processes into a new position. So the styloid process of the ulna is here. Uh, and that's your lot. We've done the olecranon, the trochlear notch, the coronoid process, the radial notch, um, the tuberosity of the ulna. We've done the supinator crest and fossa, and then we've done the shaft, the head of the ulna, and the ulna tubercle there. All right. So again, the point of this, if you've heard of uh, these bony bits, so that if somebody's talking about the ulna and the parts of the ulna, or if they're talking about the forearm in general, maybe you're looking at fractures on x-ray or some other radiology, you will have heard of these bits. And the next second time you look at them, it'll be easier for you to take in, it'll be a little bit easier to remember, um, but at least you'll have heard of them, right? But some of these are more important than others, uh, but that is why the ulna is shaped as it is, and that is the bumpy bits of the bony bits of the ulna. Okay, so we've done the humerus, we've done the ulna, we've done the radius, 
and I have another video where I looked at the carpal bones and the bones of the hand go and have a look at that one um, if you're so interested so next week I think we'll move on from bones we'll go and look at something different we'll come back to bones sometime in the future our year two and year one graduate entry medicine students are back so I'll be talking to them about some interesting stuff next week. I think we're doing renal and reproductive embryology and we're doing a bit of thorax stuff. So I'm sure I'll come up with something interesting to talk about next week. But otherwise, I hope this was useful. Um, keep studying, keep working at it. It's all interesting stuff, isn't it? It's all us. It's us. It's how we work. These are our bits. Uh, see you next week. Cheers, buddy. Mm.